he'll run back for part three of how to speak, uh, my reaction to it, and let's continue. Well, the last item in this uh, little block here is, uh, uh, it has to do with what people think that they do at MIT. You ask uh, faculty what the most important purpose is, and they'll say, well, uh, the most important thing I do is teach people how to think. Huh. And then uh, you say, oh, that's great. How do you teach people how to think? <laughs> Blank stare. No one can quite respond to that part, that natural next question. So how do you teach people how to think? Well, I believe that we are storytelling animals and that uh, we start uh, developing our story, understanding and manipulating skills with fairy tales in childhood and continue on through professional schools like law, business, medicine, engineering, everything. And we continue doing that throughout life. Yeah, I've noticed that um, for a lot of, you know, it might be just like actually any type of article or essay in general, but anything that's like long form writing in those types of competitions for especially high schoolers, you'll notice that what wins is generally something that has a narrative, something that continues throughout with a purpose. And the best way to achieve that happens to be, I guess, a story. So you might begin with like the nature of the crisis and then continue into, you know, the evidence and then how it affects the world today. So if you can do that in a compelling manner, I think that's really appealing to people who want to expand the scope of something's influence. And that might be why um, this type of skill is so useful in today's world. So if uh, that is what thinking is all about, then when you want to teach people how to think, you provide them with the stories they need to know the questions they need to ask about those stories, mechanisms for analyzing those stories, ways of putting stories together, ways of evaluating how reliable the story is, and that's what I think. There's also when to tell the story. So I'm going to assume that, you know, in my case, I can analyze this as story, just meaning any type of message or communication with someone else. Um, I read a... Um, up to page 121 of uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. It's a great book, and in it he mentions that there are two types of intelligence. One is practical, the other is analytical. I might be remembering that. I might be remembering that wrong, actually. But I do remember that practical is the correct terminology. Essentially, it's kind of like how you put things together in a way that's beneficial to you and you have to know every step you have to know you know it's, it's especially useful when you're trying to convince people of something because that's when you need the skills of you know putting together the story when to tell them the story and how you're going to get that message across so for example uh here's another case of uh this thing in action or i mean um analytical no practical intelligence so this morning i was in a statistics class and for a final project this student wanted to interview a teacher about um, why they did not take the vaccine for COVID and essentially he was gonna send an email to this teacher but it ended up being you know a case of I probably shouldn't send this because it'll come off as really rude so I mean, the, he did realize the right step, which is basically just go meet him in person and then ask him about it. So that's a case where uh, he did not know the proper way to get across what he uh, wanted to say, and therefore he couldn't get what he wanted. And um, yeah, let's continue. Yeah, so that basically just shows the importance of this type of skill. You need to do when you teach people how to think. But that's all about education, and uh, many of you here, not necessarily for that, but rather for uh, for this part, for persuading, which breaks down. Yeah, that's kind of like how you can turn things in your favor. That's kind of more of what I was talking about, but 
I guess we should just continue then. Uh, into several categories, oral exams, not shown, job talks, getting famous. I won't say much about the uh, oral exams other than the fact that they used to be a lot scarier than they are today. In the old days, um, reading the literature in a foreign language was uh, part of that and there was a, a high failure rate. And when you look, at the, when you look back on those, uh, on those failures, uh, the most uh, usual reason for people failing an oral exam is failure to situate and a failure to practice. Hmm. By situate, I mean it's important to talk about your research in context. Uh, this is a problem that's being pursued all over the world. There hasn't been any progress before me in the past 30 years. Um, everyone is looking for a solution because it will have impact on so many other things. So that's situating in time and place and feel. I saw this in my um, The Laws of Thermodynamics book. It's by, let me see. Doesn't say who it's by, but um, it's edited by someone called Jennifer V. Viegas. So basically, in that book, it's kind of like um, just describing how important physics and thermodynamics is. So in the introduction, which I read today, the author has to basically put across the message of how important this new research is and how revolutionary uh, the field is as a whole. So, I mean, you can see this everywhere. You have to convince people of how important certain things are. Otherwise, you can't get things to go your way. And then as far as practice is concerned... These birds are really annoying outside. They're actually they're fighting. Oh, okay, I think they're leaving. I'm just going to close the window. I close one uh, Yes, window. practice is important, but that doesn't mean uh, showing your slides to the uh, people who share an office with. The problem with that is that um, if people know what you're doing, they will hallucinate that there's material in your presentation that isn't there. It isn't there. Uh, a variation on the scene, by the way. I think this was also in uh, one of Malcolm Gladwell's other books. It's called Blink. Yeah. So. Um, in it, I, I haven't read the book, I just heard this from my book group, which was like the Gladwell group. Um, the person reading it said uh, that basically strangers actually know someone better than, you know, an acquaintance would know someone. For example, um, let's say that, you know, there was someone who had, let's say, a grudge against me. So that person would, let's say the researcher asks that person to describe me uh, in, you know, like five words. So their perceptions might be skewed by their own personal feelings. And that's kind of actually worse than just having a stranger who doesn't know anything about me. Let's say they watch like a 10 second video clip of me throughout my day. Uh, then they might actually know more because they can focus on just seeing me for what I am or whatever I'm doing. As your faculty supervisor is not a very good person to help you debug a talk because they in fact know what you're doing and they will in fact hallucinate there's material in your presentation that isn't there. So you need to get together some friends who don't know what you're doing and have them, well, you start the practice session by saying, if you can't make me cry, I won't value you as a friend anymore. <laughs> and then when you get to the faculty uh, on a uh, oral exam, it will be easy. You see, um, difficulty, or the, the amount of flack you'll get from somebody is proportional to age. Uh, the older somebody is, the more, uh, the more they understand where they are in the world. But, but the young people are trying to show the old people how smart they are, so, so, so they'll be vicious. So whenever you have an opportunity to have an examining committee that's uh, full of uh, people with uh, gray hair, that's what you want. 
Well, mm -hmm. that's just a word or two about something I haven't listed here. Let's uh, get into the subject of job talks. So I was um, sitting in a bar uh, many years ago uh, Very in uh, San Diego. I was a member of the Navy Science Board, and I was uh, sitting with a couple of uh, my colleagues on the board, uh, Dolores Eder from the University of Colorado. Uh, she made me so jealous I could spit because she had written 21 books and I'd only written 17. And then the other one was uh, Bill Weldon from the uh, University of Texas. He was a electromagnetism guy and he you know, knew how to use rail guns to, to drive steel rods through tank armor. These were interesting people. So I said, uh, what do you look for uh, in a uh, faculty candidate? And uh, within uh, one microsecond, Dolores said, they have to show us they've got some kind of vision. Hmm. Quickly followed by Bill, who said, they have to show us that they've done something. Very interesting. Insightful. Let's say, let's see my own uh, experiences of this. So, for vision, I'm not sure I've actually demonstrated that. In I mean, all I've done is kind of like, oh, actually, I did do an interview for like the IT department of uh, City Hall. For that one, I think I didn't really demonstrate vision, but I did show that I've done something. So, uh, both are important. I don't know which one's more important. Um, my opinion is uh, probably, I'm not sure actually, but for me, I've done something. I've done a lot of things and I'm trying to do more things. So that's kind of my focus. I don't know if I should change that. Let's see what he uh, does to elaborate. Oh, that sounds good, I said. And then I said to them, how long does the candidate have to establish these two things? What do you think? One minute. Well, compare your answer 30 to theirs. seconds. 30 seconds. 10 seconds. Five minutes. Oh. Well, that so would be a really short number, but I guess that's, that's actually a lot of time to work with. You haven't expressed your vision. You haven't told people that you've done something. In five minutes, you're, you're already, you've already lost. So you, you have to be able to do that. And let me just mention a couple of things in that connection. Here, which is, you know, the vision is in part a problem that somebody cares about and something new in your approach. So the problem is understanding the nature of human intelligence. And the approach is asking questions about what makes us different from chimpanzees and Neanderthals. Is it merely a matter of quantity or are we just a little bit smarter in some continuous way? Or do we have something that's fundamentally different that chimpanzees don't have and Neanderthals either? And the answer is yes, we do have something different. We are symbolic creatures and because we're symbolic creatures, we can um, we can uh, build symbolic descriptions of relations and events. We can string them together and make stories. And because we can make stories, that's what makes us different. So that's, that's, that's my stump speech. That's how I start most of my talks on my own personal research. Huh. How do you express the notion that you've done something? By listing the steps that need to be taken in order to achieve the solution to that problem. I think this is actually really useful for um, writing like college essays because I think both of these are really important and um, I think it's kind of like going to a job interview. It's basically the same thing. Uh, some colleges have like interviews as well. So uh, it's definitely going to be useful there. Uh, that's just a guarantee. So I think there's a lot to learn from this section. You don't have to have done all of those steps, but you can say, here's, here's what needs to be done. An example. 
here's what needs to be done. We need to specify some behavior. We need to enumerate uh, the constraints that make it possible to deal with that behavior. We have to implement a system because we're engineers and we don't think that we've understood something unless we can build it. And we built such a system and we're about to demonstrate it to you today. That would be an example of enumerating a series of steps needed to realize the vision. Mm -hmm. So then blah, 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 blah. And then you conclude by, you conclude by enumerating your contributions. Mm. What is that R? That... It's kind of mirror of, of these steps no and it helps to establish that you've done something. So that's a kind of general purpose framework for doing a technical talk. Now, only a few more things left to do today. Uh, getting famous is the next item on our agenda because once you've got the job, you need to think a little bit about how you're going to be recognized for what you do. So. No, so it's not really like getting like famous on the internet, let's say. It's more like getting recognized. Oh, well, first of all, why should you care about getting famous? I thought about this uh, in connection with a fundraising event I attended once fundraising event for raising money to save Venice from going underwater and having all of its art destroyed. Anyway, I was sitting here, and JC was sitting here. That was uh, Julia, the late Julia Child. Julia Child? Huh? And as the evening wore on, more and more people would come up and ask uh, Julia to autograph something or express uh, a feeling that she had changed their life and it just happened over and over again. So eventually I turned to Julia and I said, Miss Child, is it fun to be famous? And she thought about it for a second and she said, you get used to it. <laughs> but you know what it occurred to me? You never get used to being ignored. Wow. So it's, you know, it's, it's, here's a way to think about it. Your ideas are like your children. And you don't want them to go into the world in rags. So what you want to do is to be sure that you have these techniques, these mechanisms, these thoughts about how to present the ideas that you have so that they're recognized for the value that, that, that is in them. So that's why it's a legitimate thing to concern yourself with, uh, with packaging. Now, how do you get uh, remembered? Well, there's something I like to call Winston's star. And every this one of the items I'm about to articulate has a starts with an S. So if you want your presentation ideas to be remembered, one of the things you need to do is to make sure that you have some kind of symbol associated with your work. So this arch example is actually from my PhD thesis many, many years ago. And in the course of uh, my work uh, at that time, uh, this uh, work on arch learning became mildly famous and I didn't know why. It was only many years later that I realized that uh, that work accidentally had all of the elements on this star. So the first element is that there was a kind of symbol. It's the arch itself. Huh. Next thing you need is uh, some kind of slogan. A kind of phrase that provides a handle on the work. And in this case, the phrase was one shot learning. One shot learning. And it was one shot because the program I wrote learned something definite from every example that was presented to us. So in going from a model based on this configuration to something that isn't an arch based on that configuration, the program learned that it has to be on top. One shot learning. So that's a simple slogan, and now we need a surprise. Yeah, the surprise is you don't need a million examples of something. Right now I'm thinking of how to incorporate everything here into a college essay. So, I am being a bit silent, but um, let's, uh, I'm going to recap my ideas. So basically, I think the slogan would either should show up at the front and the end. And the surprise, definitely don't want it to be 
too close to the beginning. Probably like halfway through or a bit before that actually. Thing to learn. Um, you can do it with one example if you're smart enough to make use of that example appropriately. So that was the surprise. You could learn something definite from each example. Next item was a salient idea. Now, when I say salient idea, I don't mean important. What I mean is an idea that sticks out. Uh, some, some theses, funnily enough, have too many good ideas and you don't know what it's all about because <laughs> which one is it? So you need an idea that sticks out. And the idea that stuck out here was the notion of a near miss. Ah, so... You see, this is not an arch, but it doesn't miss I my guess mind. there can't be, like, too many good things or too many topics. There should just be one main appealing point, but that has to be really strong. So it's a near miss. And finally, you need to tell the story of how you did it, how it works, why it's important. Ah. I think that goes back to the steps portion of what he was saying about uh, how to tell the story. That's um, a bit on uh, how to not so much get famous, but how to ensure that your work is recognized. Oh, yeah. Well, that to, that to, we're almost finished because now we're, we're down to this last item, which is uh, how to stop. How to stop being famous. And when we come to that, uh, there's a question of, uh, all right, well, what is the final slide? Oh, that's what he means. Like how to conclude. And what are the final words? So this doesn't include the slogan, actually. So. Huh. So uh, for the final slide, let me give you some examples of possibilities. How about this one? Mm. Well, you might see that slide, and uh, think to yourself. There are a thousand faculty at MIT. Nice piece of work, but not so much. But it's only a tiny piece of work if you divide by a thousand. So when you show a whole gigantic list of collaborators at the end of a talk, it's a kind of it's a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of letdown because it suggests that nobody knows well did, did you do anything significant. Mm -hmm. Now you gotta you gotta recognize your collaborators, right? So where do you do that? None on the last slide. On the first slide. All this was on the first slide. These are the collaborators. Ah. So you don't want to put them at the end. You don't want to slide like this. How about this one? Question. This is the worst possible way to end a talk. <laughs> because this slide can be up there for 20 minutes. I've seen it happen. It squanders real estate. It squanders an opportunity to tell people who you are. It's, it's just... What about this one? Mm. I often see it. I never seen anybody write it down. Also, it wastes opportunity. Oh my I wonder God. if that's a real one. Even worse. <laughs> All of these slides do nothing for you. They yeah. waste an opportunity for you to tell people to leave people with what you, with who you are. There really is no purpose to those. Well, what about this? This is this a good one? It might seem so at first, but here's the problem. If you say these are my conclusions, these are perfectly legitimate conclusions that nobody cares about. What they care about is what you have done. And that's why your final slide should have this label. Contributions. It's a mirror of what I said over there about how job talks ought to, be, ought, ought to be like a sandwich. And the final slide, the one that's up there while people are asking questions and filing out, it ought to be the one that has your contributions on it. Oh. Here's an example from my own Wait, so stump speech. Yeah, this is what uh, oh, not I talk about a lot. Yes, here are the things that I typically demonstrate. And I wait for people to read it. And then the final element there is, this is what we get out of it. 
Is so this that's his a sample of a contribution slide? How to speak. All right, now, what about the other part? You know, you got your final slide up, slide up there, it's a contribution slide. Somehow you have to tell people you're finished. So uh, let's uh, check out a few possibilities. One thing you could do in the final words is you could uh, tell a joke. <laughs> it's okay. By the time you're done, people have adjusted themselves to your voice parameters. They're ready for a joke. I was sitting in another bar this time in Austin, Texas, with a colleague of mine. Wait, wait, Doug wait a out. minute. Is he trying to do the... Oh, he might. And Doug's a fantastic speaker. And so I said uh, to Doug, Doug, you're a fantastic speaker. What's your secret? And he said, oh, I always uh, finish with a joke. And that way, people think they've had fun the whole time. <laughs> so yeah, a, a joke will work uh, down there. Uh, how that about uh, this one? Thank you. I don't recommend it. It's a weak move. You will not go to hell if you conclude your talk by saying thank you, but it's a weak move, and here's why. When you say thank you, even worse, thank you for listening, it suggests that everybody has stayed that long out of politeness and that they had a profound desire to be somewhere else, but they're so polite they stuck it out, and that's what you're thanking them for. So once wild applause has started, you can mouth a thank you, and it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But the last thing you do should not be saying, Thank you. Oh, so there should be kind of like in Gladwell's book, there should be some sense of entitlement actually to um, one's ideas being accepted and being valued. So by kind of conceding that, it's really not doing any good for that entitlement. And I don't mean entitlement as in like uh, spoiled. I'm, I mean like entitled as in deserving of whatever and in this case it's the audience's attention because the topic is worthwhile and it was presented in a good way or compelling now you say to me well doesn't everybody say thank you well what everybody does is not necessarily the right thing yeah, can agree. And I, I like to illustrate how some talks can end without saying thank you. I, I, I like to draw from political speeches, but the ones that I've heard recently aren't so good. So, what <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to have to go go back a little bit. When so here's Governor Trump? Christie. He uh, gave the uh, mm -hmm. Republican keynote uh, address one year. Uh, this is the end of his talk. Let's see what he does. And together, everybody, together, we will stand up once again for American greatness for our children and grandchildren. God bless you and God bless America. So that's um, a classic benediction ending. God bless you and God bless America. Now, I, I don't want to be partisan about this, so I think I better switch to the huh. keynote address in the uh, Dem Democratic Convention. <laughs> I was delivered that year by, by Bill Clinton, who knows something about how to speak. If that is what you want, if that is what you believe, you must vote and you must reelect President Barack Obama. God bless you and God bless America. <laughs> Both the same. Now watch this. Let's go back a little bit and redo it. What I want you to see is that at one point he seems to be almost pressing his lips together, forcing himself not to say thank you. And then there's another place where he does a little salute. So watch for those this time around. If that is what you want, if that is what you believe, you must vote and you must reelect President Barack Obama. God bless you and God bless America. Everybody's pursing his lips. 
Where's the suit? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Now, what, what are we going to take away from this? Well, um, I suppose I could conclude yeah, this talk by saying, uh, God bless you and God bless the <laughs> <laughs> Institute of Technology. But uh, it might not work so well. But what you, what you can't get out of this is you don't have to say thank you. And there are other things you can do. And you know, it's interesting that uh, over time people figure this out and there's some stock ways of ending things. So uh, in uh, the Catholic Church, in the good old Latin Mass, it landed with Ite Missa Est, which uh, translates approximately to, okay, the Mass is over, you can go home now. <laughs> and of course, uh, at uh, musical concerts, uh, you know that uh, it's time to clap, not at the end of the song, but rather when the uh, conductor goes over and shakes hands uh, with the concertmaster. Those are conventions that tell you that the, that the event is over. Hmm. So uh, those are all possibilities for here. But uh, one more possibility, and that is that you can salute the audience. And by that I mean you can say something about how, how much you value your time at a place. So I could say, well, it's been a, a great fun being here. Uh, it's been uh, fascinating to see what you folks are doing here at MIT. I've been uh, much stimulated uh, and, and provoked by the kinds of questions you've been asked. It's been really great and, uh, and, and uh, I look forward to coming back on, on many occasions in the future. So that salutes the audience. You can do that. Hmm. Well, there it is. Um, you know what? Uh, I'm glad you're here. And, and the reason is by being here, I think you have uh, demonstrated an understanding that uh, how you present and how you package your ideas is an important thing. And I salute you for that. <laughs> and uh, uh. I uh, suggest that you uh, come back again and bring your friends. Very nice. Are we over? A couple of seconds. Oh, all right, it is over. All right, so the the lecture was really good, and I think that I should rewatch it several times. Actually, it's kind of like like um. One of those classic movies or books that, you know, you can read like 10 times, you might not get everything in there. So I think this is the same way. And I look forward to maybe looking at this again in the future. And I think that you, the audience, by watching my video, I think that you really have um, a sense of desire for learning things that aren't really just about math and science, but ways to actually bring those ideas forward. So, for that, I salute you.